That was an absolute, complete fucking nightmare. It's like, I'm gonna spend 30 years of my life at Procter & Gamble selling diapers, and then I'm gonna retire and play golf and then die. I'm like, what is the reason to even be alive? So I'm like, I'm having this existential kind of crisis on the first day at Procter & Gamble, and I'm like, is this really my dream? And then I meet this intern guy in the elevator, and I'm kind of doing like a stand-up shtick or whatever with him. He's like, you should go be an actor. And I'm like, you know what? He's fucking right. You are listening to The Escape Artist, the podcast that helps you to decide if, when, and how to quit your safe corporate career and discover your true calling in life. In each episode, I interview guests who have made that often terrifying, but usually liberating leap. Some of my guests have made it. Some have become incredibly famous. Some are very rich. And some of them aren't. But what they all have in common is that that they're a whole lot happier than they were before. In the times of the Corona crisis, that intro you just listened to it doesn't really feel right anymore. To give you some context, in the last 10 months, I've been interviewing guests who have left their corporate careers to find their passion. Actors, boxing gym owners, entrepreneurs, you name it. Is now the right time to be thinking about leaving our corporate jobs and finding meaning in what we do? Most of us that are still employed are probably very happy that this is still the case. But you know what? For some, it actually might be. This can be a time for reflection, an opportunity to figure out what we really want to do in our lives. But also, right now, the rosy and romantic times of being an entrepreneur, they're over for a while. And this is why I will release a bonus episode for each guest. I will cover how they're dealing with the harsh reality of being alone in this time of crisis, how they're covering costs, the actions they're taking to survive, their hopes and their fears in times of Corona. So let's get started. So James, welcome. We met an MBA program in China. Um, it was back then, like I think ranked in the top 10 in the world by Business Week, I believe, or one of the others. Uh, Howard was number three. Back then you were an MBA student at Schulich in Toronto. Anyhow, you just did an internship at Walmart and your dream was to work for Procter & Gamble. And then you got your MBA, you did get that job at Procter & Gamble. And then though, you quit. And you quit and announced that you're moving to China to become a superstar. And I'm just curious, what happened? Boom, that's right, that's correct. Um, on my first day at Procter & Gamble, so there was an intern there in the elevator. I was cracking some jokes with him and he was like, you know what, man, you should be an actor. And I'm like, you know what? This guy's fucking right. And literally on that spot, I'm like, there's no way I'm staying here more than two years. I, I have to go be an actor. Because when I was in high school and an undergraduate degree, I took in some drama courses. I really loved acting, but I never thought it would be a full-time job. Um, but that first day at Procter & Wait, 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 wait. So you were in an elevator. Yeah. And had a random conversation with an intern. What happened in that elevator? So, uh, <laughs> so before that elevator ride, there was a speech given by a guy that was retiring from Procter and Gamble, and he had been there for thirty years. And he was giving this heartfelt kind of speech about like, what an amazing thirty years! I'm retiring. I'm going to play golf, and then you know, essentially, I'm going to die. And the president of the company got up after he spoke and he was like, thank you so much, Phil. We wish you a great retirement. Phil walked out and then he's like, Brenda is taking Phil's spot. Brenda, come say hello to everybody, right? It's just like, he's gone, who cares? Like next, next person up, right? And to me, that was an absolute, complete fucking nightmare. It's like, I'm gonna spend 30 years of my life at Procter & Gamble selling diapers and then I'm gonna retire and play golf and then die. I'm like, what is the reason to even be alive? So I'm like, I'm having this existential kind of crisis on the first day at Procter & Gamble. And I'm like, is this really my dream? And then I meet this intern guy in the elevator and I'm kind of doing like a stand-up shtick or whatever with him. He's like, you should go be an actor. And I'm like, you know what? He's fucking right. He's, he's absolutely fucking right. So that's, that's kind of what led to that, that moment. 
does he, this intern, yeah. do you know his name? Abenov, yeah. Uh, d does he know he changed, his, he changed your life? I don't think so, no. Do no. you, you want to say something to Abenov? He might be listening. <laughs> Abenov, my, my first child is going to be named Jesus Christ after Jesus Christ, but my second child will be named Abenov in his, uh, in his honor. And then one and a half years went away, you did your job, and then you actually, you decide to do it. What happened during that time? Did you get more anxious? Did you meet more interns? <laughs> well, I thought, you know what, the, the infamous P&G marketing trading in Cincinnati happened, I think, about eight months into the job. And I'm like, you know what, I'll stay at least till then. I'll do the training and then I'll leave. But then after I got through the training, I was like, you know what, I still have some things, you know, some more things to learn here. I want to save some more money before I go to, ch to, uh, to go be an actor. And uh, so I ended up staying like a year and a half. But by that point, I decided where I want to go. I'd saved enough money and I felt like it, it was time. It was time at that point. So... I didn't know that I was going to go to China. At first, I thought, like, I'll probably go to Los Angeles. But after thinking more about China, you know, because I met you in China, right? Yes. So I had done two summer internships over there, doing, like, one during my undergrad, one during my MBA. And I'm like, fuck, why not go be an actor in China? Because the entertainment market, just looking at the numbers over there, was growing immensely. And it was only a matter of time before, you know, it exceeded North America as the biggest entertainment market in the world. So, so. You, you literally did a market analysis of the fastest growing markets. Where should I establish the, the James Adolf's brand? And you'd pick China based on market data. Oh, dude, 100%, man. 100%. It was like a P&G approach, right? It's like, where are you going to, you know, where do you have the right to win? You know, P&G, you talk about like size of prize. If you're going to go after some market, right? It's like you want to play in a big market. It's scalable. And it's like you, you make a conservative estimate. Okay, what if I get 1% of this market? Is that worth my time? And it's like, do I want to get 1% of North America or do I want to go out there and kill myself and try to get 1% of China? It's like, it's much better to go 1% of China. So, you know, why not, why not go over there? And there's less competition too, right? As a Caucasian actor in China. A handsome, Caucasian, um, tall. I didn't realize, I didn't remember how tall you were until we met in the lift and I tried to give you a hug and I just had my, your nipples in my face. <laughs> Which I know you like that kind of thing, but that, that, that's fine. <laughs> that that grinder moment we hoped for finally has happened. That's yeah, right. Phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, man. That's right. Okay. So you were like, okay, I'm blonde, I'm handsome, and the market makes sense, and there's not as much competition. 100%. Right? 100%. And, and you, you, for the listeners, you speak fluent Mandarin, or did you speak fluent Mandarin at the time? I do now. At the time that I met you, I could speak some. It was semi-functional, but when I got back to, over to China to be an actor, I found out very quickly it was not nearly good enough. Like I was going into auditions and I was just failing like flat on, flat on my face because you need really high level language to be able to act like a scene. So it took me about a year and a half to get my language abilities up to par where I could actually start landing roles right. in that marketplace. So, so you went there and you realized, oh my God, my Chinese is not as good. My Mandarin is not as good. I, I, gotta, I gotta practice. How, how, did you, how did you learn it? Uh, a big way, so I started learning a bit when I was at PNG because um, I was trying to ramp up a little bit before going over there. Uh, but before going to China and after getting to China, this is going to make me sound like a horrible human being. But uh, one of my one of my main ways of doing this was actually like going on dates with with Chinese girls, um, <laughs> and I would go on a date pretty much with any Chinese girl, whether she was attractive or not, because the objective was not to date her, but to like to speak Mandarin with her. So what I'd usually do is set up a date at a Starbucks. And then, you know, at that time I was saving money for, you know, for going to be an entrepreneur, pr pursue my dreams in China. So I'm, uh, I, what I would do is I'd show up on purpose five to 10 minutes late to the date so that they would buy their own drink. So you didn't have enough money to buy her coffee? No, 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 I did. But I'm like, you know You're what, let's, let's be efficient about this. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'd show up five to 10 minutes late. Generally, they would buy their own drink. And then I'd sit down and we would have, you know, a nice time. And we'd chat and we'd chat in Mandarin. And at first, like my Mandarin was, it was, it was not great. But uh, that really, really fucking helped. So right. I, I did that a lot. I probably went on hundreds of dates like that. I mean, honestly, if I met someone that was, you know, nice and intelligent and stuff like that, for sure, I'd be willing to date them. But uh, there was definitely an, an ulterior ulterior motive. So going I, on there. I imagine there are all these girls out there. They're like, "Oh yeah, James, he's famous. Yeah. I went on a date, and now they realize, actually, I was just a language a free language class, <laughs> and he didn't even buy me a coffee." Oh my god, I did buy a few. I did buy a few. I mean, looking back, am I am I proud of that behavior? No, but uh, at the time, I'm like, you know what, you got to do like, don't be naive about this shit. If you want to go do something like be an entrepreneur, it is extremely extremely fucking difficult. And it's a jungle out there. So you got to do some things. I mean, I wasn't breaking any hearts, right? I wasn't. Uh, yeah, you weren't. I, was, <laughs> I wasn't doing anything illegal, 
you know, I wasn't giving them long lasting uh, PTSD from, from what I was doing. So whatever, but honestly, the biggest thing that helped though, I think other than that was once I got to China, I hired a one-on-one -on -one tutor who I worked with probably six days a week for about six months. And that really supercharged the learning process. How many hours? <sighs> probably three hours a day, three right. to four hours a day. Okay. And then the rest was self-study. Um, and actually, um, so the way how I learned English was I had a decent teacher early on, but I was a lazy student. But then I, um, I lived in Norway uh, for my first year. And what frustrated me is that, so I'm slightly funny, right? I'm, I'm German and I come with like a handicap and humor, but I just couldn't crack any jokes like on the spot, right? And so I kind of was frustrated that my English wasn't witty enough. And so what it did is I actually just burned through TV series. I would scrubs in English with subtitles. And then a word comes up like shrink. I'm like, oh, I know shrink. It means shrinking, but it doesn't mean, I didn't know it me meant um, somebody who you know takes care of your m mental uh, issues. Yes. So I would pause it, write it down, and then actually learn those words this way. And so I was highly entertained watching Scrubs, which I love, and then The Simpsons and Prison Break and it goes on and on and on, right? Unfortunately, in porn, there's not enough dialogue. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't really help. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, so I, I watched it and it was actually enjoyable. And so for you, you actually took those dates, you met interesting women or in, in general, didn't even have to buy them coffee and learn English. This is a brilliant approach and I absolutely love it. And um, uh, very, very nice. Okay, so um, so in this lead up period, right, um, the, the dream was looming, but when did that, when did you really make the decision? When were you like, okay, now I'm moving to China, now I'm going to be doing it? It was, again, it was probably after the, uh, like, marketing training at P&G in Cincinnati. And then part of it was related to money. Like, I had, a, I felt I had enough money to survive for at least a year if I had zero income. Um, that was a big part of it. And uh, I, oh, also, one of my other objectives at that time is I lined up a scholarship to a very good university in Beijing where they paid you, you know, part of your living expenses. So I felt like that, that was also a kind of financial help to, you know, pursuing my entrepreneurial ideas over there. So that took a little while to get that lined up. I also felt, to be honest, like for my parents, who would be very supportive of me, I wanted to let them know that I wasn't just doing something by the seat of my pants, that I had like really thought this through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know people, you know, you shouldn't be listening to your parents' advice on, on everything, but it was definitely something I was doing, you know, partly for my parents, to mm -hmm. be honest, because I didn't want to think I was, I was just jerking off and you know, running somewhere across the world. Speaking speaking of uh, your parents and whatnot, that conversation with your manager at P and G or your parents, and like, I'm quitting this job. I'm moving to China to, to become famous an actor. <laughs> How did that conversation go down? I'm just trying to imagine that. Yeah, well, with my manager at P and G, I think she saw it coming because I started to get wackier and wackier in the office. I started wearing wackier and wackier clothing especially after like the, the, sort of halfway through my year and a half there. Um, like I was on the like arts committee. I was on the performing arts committee. I was on the glee competitions at PNG and stuff like that. So she knew I was a little bit of a wacky character. So it wasn't that big of a shock to her. Um, but uh, yeah, my parents, they were pretty shocked, but they were, they were, they were fully, um, they were fully uh, supportive. Like no, no, they no did. doubt. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I, I did the PNG thing with them, right? right? I gave them the pitch. Yeah. I'm like, listen, like this is the size of prize. I have a chance, you know, a right to win in the marketplace. I if I succeed at this, there's a, there's a huge reward, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they they uh, they they saw the logic in it. Okay. Let's let's talk about the announcement. You uploaded a video. Oh yes. And uh, this video, um, just from memory, um, it was a long time ago when I watched it. Nine, <laughs> nine, ten years ago or something like that. <laughs> From memory, you, you were wearing a, speaking of wacky clothes, you were wearing a sparkling blazer and you went in a subway station and the first sentence was, Schmello world. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you, and you compared yourself to Kim Jong-il and I don't know who it was, um, <laughs> announcing that you would be moving to China. It was a 10 minute video, uh, approximately half in English, half in, half in Chinese. At one point, I think you were doing push ups in a borrowed, borrowed mankini in a playground. <laughs> and then you were talking to baby Jesus in, in, in Chinese. Um, just yeah. wondering, uh, what drove you to this video and what's the story behind this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, is this an accurate summary of the script and what was in it? No, 100%, yeah. I, I forgot about that video completely until you brought that back up, but thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I just wanted to do something that I could easily announce to all my friends and family, like where I was going without <laughs> also, having to call them all. scale and efficiency. Dude, scale and efficiency, man. 
So thank you, Google, for uh, for YouTube. Even though I did, I think, share it to Facebook primarily to get it uh, to get it shared around. But it was just yeah, it was an efficiency thing. And to show people, you know, also do a little kind of like wacky showbiz, you know, kind of stuff to uh, to 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 get that out there. So um, yeah, it was it was a scale, it was an efficiency thing. Was totally. it? Was it? Was it not? Like, I was thinking about this yeah. right before as I was flying over on the plane. I thought, did he do it to essentially burn all bridges? <laughs> it, was, it was nuts. Yeah. It was absolutely nuts. And it was like, did he do this to burn all bridges and just be like, okay, I have no way back. Yeah. I have no back into the corporate world. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It was almost it was it was actually almost like oh, I also wanted to test myself. Could I do something that was funny and outrageous that people would enjoy watching? Um do you because think people that's enjoyed watching it? Oh, well, I mean, I think it was scarring for people's eyes. Yeah, seeing me at a mankini and stuff like that, for sure. But uh, I was almost, at that point, I was I had almost worked myself into a fervor of, I don't want to call it insanity, but I was so extroverted and so willing to take risks um, because that was a mindset I needed at the time. Because when you're leaving your job and your career, something that you've done and trained for your entire life, basically from high school, you need to be extremely risk-taking to do that. So you have to have the right mindset. So I was almost like on a daily basis for basically, you know, six months, pumping myself up into that space. And I was doing things like I was going out. Push-ups and bikinis on playgrounds. What's it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally, totally. But I, I really got big into like uh, hitting on girls in public at that time. I was like, um, you know, how can I, uh, like to me at that time, one of the big things in my life that, that gave me a lot of, um, this sort of ease this anxiety about going to do, do a, a huge change in my life was, c can I find a wonderful woman to be with? And when I did, like that gave me a lot of uh, pleasure and reduced my anxiety. So meeting so, girls. So how public are we talking? Like it, where are you putting yourself to the test? What so I would like in, in the subway, I would go to shopping malls and like go to the food court and I would just literally stand there for like maybe an hour or two hours and hit on maybe like 50 girls. 50. Yeah, and maybe get, you know, 15 or 20 phone numbers. And it was just, it was so, it was so, this sounds insane, right? But yes. it was almost like a test by fire for the kind of thing that I was going to do. Because as an actor, you walk into auditions and literally 90, 95, 95% of the auditions you do or hire, you get rejected. So putting yourself in that kind of mindset, I think is really important. And I don't know fully why I was doing it, but it just, it felt good and it kept me in the right mindset to do that kind of stuff. Like now that kind of thing, like, I'm like, I was, I was fucking crazy back then, but it allowed me to go do what I needed to do to pursue my, my entrepreneurial goals. Speaking of which, do you have any formal acting training or anything like that that uh, enabled you? So I had taken some courses in school, but right. it was never my major. Um, I had taken like acting school in Toronto in the lead up for my departure to China. I had taken two acting, probably over four months. I had done some training, but I had never like, done like, like a formal was training. Like an over evening like, school? Or, like, yeah, 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 exactly. How many times a week? Uh, I think that was three times a week. Right. Yeah. One That's and a half the kind hours, of something like that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. One and a half hours, like an evening class. Is yeah. that what you did? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's the kind of stuff that, like, most actors, they have acting coaches and acting schools that they mm. do almost constantly. Um, like even in between gigs, even when they're like an established actor, to just keep your craft kind of kind of honed. So, um, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so women free. Acting classes, free <laughs> Chinese classes. Yeah. Wow, that, that's a very interesting approach. Yeah. You combine your passion with uh, your other passion and don't even buy the, the, them a coffee. 100%. Phenomenal. Okay, so you in, so in that lead up, okay, you were putting yourself into the malls. Um, <laughs> and that was your preparation. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, I would even do things like I would go into a mall and on the bottom level, like there would be five levels stacked on top of each other with like, you know, an atrium, you could look down, I would lie down on the floor in the mall, and just look up at the ceiling. And I'd set my timer for like five minutes, I just lie there on the floor, and people would walk by and look down at you and be like, what the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> and then people from like the atriums above, they'd look down and be like, what the fuck is this guy? And like some people were laughing, some people were concerned. And generally like a lot of times security would come over before the five minutes were up and be like, sir, like you need to get up and keep going. But again, it was like a test. I would sit down on escalators. You know how like an escalator goes up, most people stand up and look forward. I would sit down on the escalator and look backwards and have conversations with people, with people below me on the escalator. 
Like it wasn't like I was seeking out this like consciously on purpose. It almost felt like an like an like an outvent for my my state of mind that was at that time. Okay, so you were experimenting and you were just going into public spaces and you did random things just yes. to see what happens and to combat fear, right? Um, was was that it? Yeah, like it was like I, I realized what I was doing and I had this like high anxiety, but like high energy and like I was positively looking forward to it. But it's like I needed to grind that emotion on some kind of stone because during the daytime I was at Procter and Gamble and like selling diapers, right? I was working on Pampers. That's what I was doing. So I needed some kind of outlet because I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was doing acting school here. I wasn't going to any any auditions in Toronto though. But I just need like an outlet for this kind of this kind of emotion. I guess okay. I don't know. Wow. Um, let's switch gears. Okay. The early days in China. Yes. Um, Did you have a plan? Did you have a, a plan B in some case something fails? Did you put yourself a budget or time frame? Just talk me through that early initial period with you going over, I imagine going to your first editions, just landing in China and being like being on the ground. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, on the plane ride over, I fell asleep and then I woke up as we were going over Japan and I just said to myself, like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, this is ridiculous. I don't know anybody in Beijing. I've never been there before. No, I had been there once, but... It was, it, was, uh, it was a little crazy, man, but uh, I did have enough money to survive about a year, so I wasn't super concerned about that. And I, I mean, that is something I do recommend if you're going to do something entrepreneurial is try to save up as much money as you humanly can. Because if you're worried about like paying your rent, especially in the first 12 months, that's going to add on a lot of unneeded anxiety. Um, but uh, when I got there, just trying to meet people in the entertainment industry was very difficult. And um, it was a slow grind, man, going to a lot of different like parties and and like, you know, parties at embassies, just, you know, trying to meet people. So it took a while to get the ball rolling. But even the first few auditions that I did, again, my Chinese was not nearly good enough. So it was it was there was a lot of negative um, feedback at the beginning because I'm like, this is not going as, as quickly or as well as I thought that mm. it, it could potentially go. Mm. And I also found out there's quite a few other actors from North America in China, like guys who had trained at like Tisch at NYU or like down at, uh, you know, USC, like the drama school down there. Not a huge number, not like what it is in Los Angeles, but. So not, not every waiter, every server. <laughs> exactly. They're all English teachers, right? In, in, in Beijing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there are some, but then there was like professional guys mm. who all they did was acting in China. So, um, so you murdered one by one. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, Game of Thrones, crossbow <laughs> on the toilet. No doubt. No doubt. Um, but, uh, Yeah, it was there was a lot of negative emotion at the beginning, man. It's hard. I think for any entrepreneur, you you got to deal with that. Not everybody has the mindset to do that, man. To mm. like to grind something out for a year or two years, it, it's very very challenging. It's very challenging. Yeah. Going back to the early days, um, you, you said you said it was slow to get the ball rolling, and but how did you get it rolling? What was that initial first push, the first success? Probably, I guess I found an agent uh, to be a model over there. Right. And once you sort of started getting steady modeling gigs and work, that was a big confidence booster. Um, and that also enabled you to start to go to some other parties and other networking things where you started to meet, you know, agents who were involved in television or film. So that was a big breakthrough. Um, the other thing was, is I went on a dating show over there that at the time it was the number one rated TV show in China. And looking back on it, it's like embarrassing that I ever did it. So it's called uh, If You Are The One, yes. right? Um, Fei Chang Wu Ra. Correct. Can you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you pronounce it? Fei Chang Wu Ra. Oh, yeah. 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 You do speak Mandarin. You weren't kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, which is, uh, I think, called Take Me Out in the UK or something like that. That, yeah. that, that format exists somewhere else. Okay. Just just for the listeners, um, describe what, what that dating show was. So it's a dating show. I believe there's... 12 to 20 females on stage. They bring out one male at a time and they basically pepper you with questions. And if you're able to make it through like two or three rounds of questions without all of the females like hitting their X button, saying right. they're not the light interested, goes off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the light goes off, um, then you get to basically, maybe if there's two or three left, you can choose from one of them. And then you can basically like propose to her to take her out on a first date. Right. And if she says yes, you know, you get her number and you're successful. But um, a lot of people don't even get to that round. So right. uh, I did it. I got to this one girl that I was interested in, and uh, I asked her as she rejected me. So, um, so uh, her name is the Ice Queen. Her I name believe. is the Ice Queen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just to give the listeners a bit more of an idea of uh, the Ice Queen and what was going on there. 
<laughs> well, she had done a lot of plastic surgery, but uh, she was so attractive and she had the most fans of any girl on the show. Because mm -hmm. most of these girls on the show were very smart. They, were, they would stay on the show for a number of months and you would get hundreds of thousands of social media followers at that time. Oh, so they're actually not there to get a guy. They're just there to be, don't have a guy and build their profile. The majority of right. people on the show, they're doing it for self-promotional reasons, whether right, okay. they admit it or not. Uh -huh. So this girl was selling merch to her fans on Weibo. Weibo is kind of like a, you know, a Twitter, I guess, right. Instagram, Facebook hybrid over in China. And um, she's, she's a very smart lady. So she didn't get, she, she didn't go with me. Um, and uh, I got about, I think I got about 7,000 followers from the first time. I was on actually- Weibo? Or, on Weibo, yeah, yeah. exactly. Which and, is the Instagram or the Twitter of China? <sighs> what is it? It's more of a Twitter, but mm -hmm. it's the only platform that's public in terms of you can follow other people because WeChat, which is probably the more important platform over there, it's it's like Facebook Messenger. Right. So you're only chatting with people you have direct links with that you've, that you've added. So it's really the only platform where it's like on Instagram and on Twitter, you can follow other individuals publicly. Okay. And, it, and it's not just your mom uh, was watching that. Actually, I think 50 million people watch that show in China, right? It's their av their yeah. average viewership is like 50 million people. Right. It's a lot. Okay. So I went on a second time. I got about 5,000 more followers because I failed the first time. But every year they've got a like redemption episode where they invite back like the five most popular failed suitors from the past year. So I got voted on to that by like the fans and then I did it and then I was successful the second time. And so what you did was you went down in one knee, right? In front of her. Oh, this is the first time. The first yeah. time, yeah. yeah. In front of the ice cream. Yes. Uh, people's hearts were stopping. Yeah. And you asked her out. Yes. And she said? And she said no. She said no. And she said no, yeah. <laughs> because you're too young. Yeah, she said it was because I was too young. Uh, but I mean, nobody on the show had ever like knelt down, but I was like, you know, do something ridiculous, like you're proposing for marriage instead of just asking her out. And oh, my father and my sister had also flown over. So I, I, I linked up some story that was like, you know, my father and my sister know that I like you so much, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I said some, you know, very kind of romantic thing. She actually started crying, but then she, she rejected me. So, um, you know. Uh, she started crying, but she, she said, what did you say to her that she started crying? I don't know. It was something about like, you know, I want to know, I want to let you know that I'm serious. So I had my family fly over here to mm -hmm. be in the audience with you. And I think she was really, really moved by, by okay. that. Okay. So, all right. So she said no, but that, so that was the first show you were on and that was the launch pad for what? for exposure and mm -hmm. then having like agents and producers reach out to me proactively on social media in China. So that really got me my first audition ever for anything. So I was very thankful for that. Um, that, was, that was a big break. That was a really big break. But then again, like my Chinese still wasn't good enough. I continued to got rejected from auditions left, right and center for probably another year uh, before my Mandarin was good enough to start getting, I got my a first, role basically. And how did you, how did you make money initially? Did you make any money? So I had savings. Mm -hmm. Um, I was making some money from modeling. That was really a, a lifeline. Yeah. And I basically eked, eked it through. I eked it through the first year and a half like that. I'm not sure if I remember this correctly, but I believe you were even like in Chinese nightclubs working as an entertainer in like Kim Jong-il costumes and some other crazy stuff. <laughs> but by the way, you can't, uh, uh, you can't, cannot hide the truth from me. So, okay, uh, hey, hey, so fair talk enough. with me in some of the other jobs as well, James. Fair enough. Yeah, well, I was a gigolo. I sold my body in the street corners <laughs> at night, um, but only to beautiful Dude, older no, women. Uh, right, okay. So mm -hmm. it's fine, right? Yeah. G God will be fine with that. But uh, no, I did, yeah, so... I did uh, the biggest nightclub in Beijing at the time, which had a lot of like entertainment people in there. I went in there and I said, hey, like, give me a job working somewhere in this place. Like I can do whatever you want. So I worked that for, I think three nights. And I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. Like I cannot do this. And people also look down on you. Like if you're working in a nightclub there. So I'm like, this is really not a good idea. So I tried some things like that. Yeah, no, no doubt. But um, I did go to a club in a Kim Jong-il uh, outfit, not for Halloween either. I mean, it's always good to do those kind of things in nightclubs, you know, to, uh, to spice things up. But um, yeah, it was hard. I lived in a very shitty part of the, uh, the city with three people from Kazakhstan in a two bedroom apartment. So that was very interesting. Got to know about the Kazakh people. By the way, never bring up the movie Borat with people from Kazakhstan, men from Kazakhstan. <laughs> 
They don't they, like it. They don't like it. They li- when I brought it up, they literally said to me with a very straight face, "If you mention Borat again, we will kill you." And they they weren't joking. So I never brought that up again. What was that first show or like the, the first true acting job that you got? And how long did it take? The first acting job I got was actually a, it was actually a very large role in a TV show. It was essentially like the main character, and it was all in English. So that was like very lucky because acting in your native language is much much easier than acting in your second language. Like as you know, like your command of English is phenomenal. You have like phenomenal native le- uh, level English. If I just didn't have this German accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, that keeps it sexy, man. So that's fine. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, the ladies like it. The ladies like it, man. Um, but uh, I just lucked out where I, like, I looked exactly like the guy the director had in mind. Um, and I had the right build and the right, like, you know, everything for that for that particular role. And my grandfather was even like a fighter pilot in World War II. It was a role as a fighter pilot because there's tons of World War II. Yeah, okay. My, my grandfather there. was in air defense, so he was probably shooting at your grandfather. <laughs> perfect. Lucky none of them hit. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yes. Was he actually in air defense? Yes. No shit, yeah, man. He was, he was. Was that part of the, the Luftwaffe, or is you part of the ground? I'm, like I'm, not, the, um, I'm not entirely sure um, which part he was in, but he was also, so he was air defense, and then he toured Europe. He was pretty much everywhere. Uh, he got captured, and then eventually by Americans in, uh, was in France and Prison camp for a long, long time. Crazy stories. <sighs> Holy uh, smokes. Yeah. But which would be for maybe a different type of uh, a conversation or a podcast. So I'm more curious about, um, you know, your time in China. But okay, so, um, wait, what are you saying? You were saying, um, where were we? I'm going to Qingxian by myself. I'm going by myself on that road. I don't need your help. I just need bullets. I, I just need some bullets. <laughs> just give me your bullets. Oh, come on. Listen. <laughs> All I need is your gun. I can do it by myself. You understand? I'm a soldier. I can go by myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, the first role, the, the first yes. big breakthrough role. So a lot of acting stuff is like there's a huge number of people out there that are very talented at, at what they do. Yeah. But you have to be lucky. Like luck is an h- enormous factor in that mm-hmm. industry. Mm-hmm. So I lucked out in that situation and I got this role. And then that basically started everything else for me. Because once – he was he's a very big director in China. Like his movie – one of his films last year was the, I have the third biggest in the Chinese box office that year. So he's a very well-known director. And uh, I got to film on this thing for three months. And I did, I think I had, I was in like, I had about 450 scenes in that show. Right. Which I basically got my acting chops. Like I got my four years of acting training in that one show. Hmm. Three months, insanely like intense shooting every day. And that set me up for like everything else that was to come, so. Right, and now, so now you've been in 14 movies, seven TV shows, is that right? Yeah, the other way around. The other I think way around. Like a seven films and I think 14 TV shows it is now, so. And most of them big characters, like right. filming for three months kind of kind okay. of situation. You want to expose to us to the Japanese? <laughs> a life, the value of a life. If you don't know what that means, you're not a human, okay? You Chinese people are just a bunch of animals. Shut up! You also, um, I think, a host on a talk show with a, a bunch of foreigners. Yes. So that was probably, honestly, that was probably the biggest thing that I've done in China in terms of uh, gaining followers on social media there. So What's it, the was, name of that it show? was a show called A Bright World, mm-hmm. which is stolen from, they bought the rights from a show in South Korea. It's basically like The View, but with guys. Oh. Now, James. It took. It cost a lot of money to create this. I mean, you're goddamn it, right it did. Was it all worth it? <laughs> was it all worth it? You know what, Cameron? It was mother trucking worth it because we got so many subsidies from the Australian government down there. It was a hoot. It was great. The uh, Hui Baolu was so gall. It was- <laughs> and there's 11 guys. What, and what's, what's the view? The view is a show I believe on ABC that's. Uh, got four girls on it and they talk about like current event stuff. It's like a talk show, but with four women. And they all, each woman has a very different personality and mm-hmm. then they bring a different view to the, you know, the topic of conversation. And they've got a celebrity, a different celebrity on each episode. And so you want to show, is it acting or is it you as James? Like what, what has happened? You play show? yourself. Right, you so play I was, yourself. I was the only person from the at the acting or entertainment industry on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody else was from different in, in industry backgrounds, but they all, sp- spoke amazing Mandarin. And when you talked about, uh, you know, present day topics and you had a different celebrity coming on the show uh, every week, which was amazing to get to interact with those kind of people, the super famous people in China. And 
And our ratings were good, but not great. We were nationally broadcast uh, Thursday nights at 9 p.m. for two seasons. How many, and how many viewers per episode? I think it was around like 35 or 40 million. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then we get a few million viewers on video, like online video streamed uh, after that. So we were getting, like I was getting between five and 10,000 followers per week from that, while that show was broadcasting. Because the difference with that and being an actor, like as you're an actor, unless you have a very like standout role, for some reason, it's it's more difficult to get followers from that because your name is not below your face, right? But mm. when you are playing yourself on a talk show, your real name is directly beneath your face. So it's just easier for people to find you online. Why, why are photos important? Followers are very important in the entertainment industry now, also for modeling mm. um, in those kind of the entertainment industry because that, that is power. If you have a big following, it is more likely that you will get cast in things. So if they're choosing between two guys who are very good for a role, one has 100,000 followers, one has zero, they're probably gonna choose the guy with 100,000 followers. Right. Do, do you also do sort of, are you like an influencer? Do you like do paid promotion on social media, stuff like that? So I do do paid promotion on social media, mm -hmm. but I don't really do, I have never like made my own content. Right. Because so on, on Weibo or, or whatnot? On Weibo, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, so the first movie, that that series, the three months, did, did I pay you well? Did that give you like a bit of a longer survival time? Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. My okay. first like real injection of cash over there. And uh, it broadcast, I think about a year and a half later on, on Chinese TV. It actually broadcast just as my talk show was going to air. So they were both airing at the same time. Wow. So it was pretty, it was like a double whammy, man. It was pretty fucking crazy. Like taping, cause taping this talk show, man, we would have girls like at the train stations and at the airports waiting for us to arrive where we were filming. Like it, it was, it was like outside of our hotels, just like waiting with flowers for us and stuff like that. It's, it was very, very bizarre experiencing that kind of thing. I want to talk with you about transformation as in you were, uh, initially, I think experimenting with different personalities. Uh, at one point you dyed your hair white. Uh, you gave yourself the name Bai Chan Chan, something like that, which means white lightning or thunder, something like that. Uh, and then you dyed your hair black and you almost look Chinese. I think you changed your name to something else. Is that right? Um, talk me through, give a bit of context to the listeners and what was happening in your head. Was it yet another mall thing where you're hitting on girls? Like what, what was the purpose? What was driving you there? Yeah. So it was in the same period where I was in this mindset of you have to be maniacally not aggressive, but open to taking risks on things. So uh, I did dye my hair white. What my, my inspiration, it was part of a peacocking phase, which by the way, you fucking started my friend. I don't know if you remember this, but ladies and gentlemen, listeners, Alex Nick, I was in a, uh, we were in Shanghai and he got this shiny metallic silver jacket made and it was fucking amazing. Cause we were at some like party or something and everybody was coming up to him being like, wow, where did you get that jacket? It was custom tailored. Yes. It cost me fortune, $18. <laughs> I got it at a small little market in, you know, like all those, uh, uh, yeah, fabric mall stores where you can get shirt mates and whatnot. And I chose a fabric and, you know, I got a, a few uh, jackets made, blazers. And one of them was like, you know what? Gonna go for silver. And you got, you, you got the gold one then. Yes. I got the silver and the gold oh, one. <laughs> Both. Yeah, because I was like, listen, if this many people come up to Alex when you've got the silver one, imagine how many people come up, you have the gold one as well. Which one, which one was better? Which, which one gave you more attention? So I found the gold was a little bit too feminine. The silver hit the right spot between flashy, but also still masculine. So I rocked that one quite a bit. Right. But that started me doing other things, man. Like I started wearing like green pants to the office. I started wearing like purple shirts. I start, I dyed my hair fucking white. You were wearing also purple, purple or blue shoes, uh, I think. Like that was still a bit P&G, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at PNG, I had blue custom Nikes with Bai on one shoe and Shan Shan on the other, which at that time was my Chinese name, right? Because that was going to be like my stage name in China, right? Bai and Shan Shan. Bai Shan Shan. White Lightning, man. Which I later found out actually doesn't, because I did this from a Chinese dictionary. It's actually more like, it literally means bling bling. <laughs> It doesn't mean white lightning. <laughs> Which is not actually bad either. It doesn't, but I mean, the, the thing is in Chinese, it's not like, it's not it's like a, a gangster thing mm. it, it, or like an, uh, you know, an urban hip hop thing. It's actually like a, like how you describe like a, a diamond or a sequence. Like it's a highly feminine thing. Oh, so like when I went out to that dating right. show and I said, my name was Bai Shan Shan, people like the audience was like, this person is ridiculous. 
Like, like not that the, white lightning was gay or, or like or like ridiculous and and I mean is it a homophobic culture what was going on? It's a it's a it's a relatively homophobic culture. But I mean, if you're going on a dating show trying to attract mm. heterosexual women and your name is Bling Bling, um, <laughs> it doesn't score you a lot of points in the right direction. Right. So uh, I didn't know that. But then eventually, like I had enough people come up to me to say Bling Bling me. Sorry, it means Bling Bling, not White Lightning. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna need to change this name. I'm okay. Gonna need to change and, this name. And, and, but do you, when did you dye your hair white? Even so I, I dyed it before I went because along the vein that you got me along of, of peacocking, I found like peacocking was very successful uh, because it makes you stand out and people want to talk to you. Like it's just- Peacocking it, for what? Peacocking for socializing, right. like with girls or just with people in general. Like mm-hmm. when you wear a silver jacket to a party, even like heterosexual men who you don't know is like, like, bro, like sweet jacket, man. You know, like, where'd you get it? Mm. It's like, why wear a brown jacket when you can wear a fucking silver metallic jacket? Of course you're gonna do that. And I was in that that expansionary social network mindset, right? Mm. So I'm like, this is great. At the time, it still is, there's this guy named Anderson Cooper who is a host on CNN. And the big thing about him is uh, he has like silver hair. At the time, he was only, I think, about 40 years old. He's also funny and a fantastic comedian. I watched him in New York uh, a couple of years Did he really? Ago. No yeah. way. Yeah, phenomenal. There you go, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't know he was that funny of a guy, but great. So he, I with think, him, I think it's him. <laughs> Maybe I'm mixing you up with another guy that looks like him. I'm, I'm bad at famous people, so that's fine. It could be the same guy, but he was known again. The peacocking thing. I'm like, wait a minute. If Anderson Cooper, like all these girls, love Anderson Cooper, even though he's a gay man because he's got silver hair at 40. What if I'm a 25 year old man and I've got silver hair? <laughs> that's even crazier. Yeah. That's even higher on the peacock level. So that's literally why I did it. So I, I was rocking that hair for probably two months, I think. And how did that go down? It was incredible. It was yeah. an incredible experience. At the time for what I wanted, um, I'm like, wow, so many people came up and talked to me. I was having like girls on the subway, initiating, con- like hot girls on the subway, initiating conversations with me. Mm. Like I'd, I'd walk on and they'd just be like, excuse me, I have to ask you about your hair. I'm like, well, I don't mind talking about that at all with you, right? It was incredible. It was like Alex, Nick, silver jacket to the next level. Right. So uh, it, it was great for that time in my life. Looking back at the stage of my life, I was, I, today I'm like, I was a crazy asshole back then. Hmm. But it was exactly, I think, the kind of mindset I needed to go do what I needed to do at that time. Um, how, did, how long did it last and why did you change it? When, when was it like, this is enough peacocking? So auditioning as an actor um, for roles where a lot of the roles required you to be kind of like stoic, mass, very highly masculine, masculine, like leading men kind of figures. And at first, you know, I was doing that. I, I, was, uh, I, was, I was acting in some of these roles and it kind of made me rethink the idea of, of masculinity and like what my personal values were. And that whole sort of like peacocking, ridiculous, like highly social, highly sexually promiscuous, like that whole package just became less and less attractive to me. I'm like, this is not what a what a real man should be. It also may have been correlated with the fact that I was getting older, right? I'm like, I'm 25, I'm 26, I'm 27 years old. I'm like, this is not this is not cool to be to mm. be an individual like this. Like, this mm. is not funny or attractive. So you wouldn't recommend it to a 35 year old man to do it now. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, go do it, man. If that's if that's what you need or you want in your life, like 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 go do it for look, sure. Look, I, I have a sequin blazer. Um, uh, hey. I, I do, I do. I mean, I've worn it once. It was like, I was a host on a corporate event. Um, but I'm waiting for the chance to wear it again. <laughs> but I wouldn't wear it on the subway every day. Um, that's fine. Um, okay, so that, that was enough. And then you, is that when you changed your hair black? Is that what happened? No, was that, that, that was part cooking? of it. That was part of it. So I, was, I also had a, uh, a roll a, uh, that needed black hair and I dyed it. I'm like, this is fucking cool. Right. And a lot of Chinese people on the street, they didn't think I spoke Chinese. And they're like, this guy looks like, there's a very famous half Caucasian, half Chinese singer over there. And everyone's like, that guy looks like this guy, Fei Xiang. And I'm like, wow, they think I look like Fei Xiang? That's great. So I'm going to keep rocking mm. the black hair. So who, who, I did that. He was like a dude, like a really masculine guy. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, very well respected. But I fell out of love with that, like the peacocking stage. And not that being, you know, a man and being more feminine on the masculine feminine scale is a bad thing at all. I just felt that uh, that, that wasn't me anymore. And I need to transition out of that. Mm. Okay. Wow. That's, that's f- phenomenal. And I didn't know that me, like, so an intern changes your career. I bought a jacket and it got you into a f- couple of years. I don't know how long you did it. For. <laughs> Three or four years wow. because of Alex Nick, man, because of Alex Nick. Is there any so. other things that come to mind that similar where you like this one instant change something in your life that you did? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
on the television show, the talk show that we were doing, there was an episode on uh, environmentalism. And they asked me to lead that show, like lead, be, be basically the, the topic leader for the show. Uh, because they knew I had done some work online as like an influencer with the World Wildlife Federate Fund in China. Um, so I did that. And in preparing for that show, I read a number of books like Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything about global warming. I read The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert. Um, and it just blew me away. In that week of preparation, I'm like, the earth is dying. And we're not talking about this. And there's not, we're not acting with the urgency that is required for this. And that changed my whole entire fucking life. Mm. So that was not like a Alex Nick blazer moment or a intern telling me I should be an actor moment, but it was absolutely like as transformational in my life for sure. And that got me even further away from the, like being a wacko peacock uh, extrovert. Uh, that's real. that has no cosmic significance. It also made me realize, uh, cause at the same time, things were going very, very well. Like I was getting five to 10,000 new followers a week. And you have like these hot girls sending naked pictures of themselves to you on social media. That shit goes to your head, man. And like, I was getting really good acting roles in China and had a really fucking sweet apartment in Beijing. And I had like 45 suits and like 20 pairs of shoes. And then I found out about all this environmental shit. And I'm like, and by the way, like, on the suits, I yes. remember you had another phase where every day you would wear a different color of a blazer with a different t-shirt. Yes. That was still the peacocking phase? That was the peacocking phase, right. yes, okay. yes. Which is not sustainable, so going back to the topic. <laughs> um, okay, so you realized, hey, I'm, I'm this bling guy and I'm I kind of, I'm taking off of this planet. It's going to my head. Let's be a bit more grounded. Is that what happened? Yes, I mean, I had already transitioned out of the peacock phase into a kind of a, uh, like an old school Hollywood phase at that point, like mm. on the show, like I had already, you know, because in China, the idea of Hollywood is like Gary Cooper, like 1940s and 1950s Hollywood. Like they think, they think men in Hollywood walk around in suits and ties and wear hats and drive like classic vintage cars. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I, I morphed into that kind of persona and that felt very masculine and that felt very correct for me as a 26, 27, 28, 29 year old man. Right. But, um, what got me, I think, out of that phase was the was the environmental thing. Realizing, listen, there's something that's much bigger than myself out there. It's much more important than just you know focusing on y you yourself and your career and that kind of stuff. And it's it scared the shit out of me. Like it's an existential problem. I'm like, I need to do something about this. Um, it's much more important than than gaining followers or mm. being a celebrity. Wow. Kind of okay, so uh, today um, you were in this environmental phase, environmental phase. And you, something was happening in your head. And I, be, I remember you were really getting into working out, becoming fit. You filmed yourself eating bucket loads of chicken. <laughs> and then you turned vegan, right? Yeah. And that was part of this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. 100%. Because, I mean, it, the, the vegan solution is like a silver bullet to many of these problems. Mm. So I am not vegan now. I, have, I was full vegan twice first for three months and the second time recently for two months. Mm -hmm. I still eat a lot of plant based food, but mm -hmm. I still do eat uh like eggs okay and you know i have meat and stuff like that occasionally but i try to do it as as, as little as possible okay what, what type of eggs and meat do you eat uh like yourself from my understanding i do you know like free the most expensive eggs at, at fucking whole foods right like the 15 dollar crate you know eggs at whole foods that yeah. kind of situation um meat i'm actually really back in now that i'm back in canada i try to get out fishing and hunting mm -hmm. because i believe that is a sustainable ethical way of getting your own meat, which is extremely controversial and it really pisses people off and that's a whole other fucking tangent. Right. But um, collecting it yourself or, uh, you know, there are some options to get it at like whole food when you have like grass fed yeah. pork, you know, or whatever. There, there is things that are still done in, in a relatively like humane way with, with animals, but it's just difficult because a lot of these solutions are not scalable to the entire world right. when you have 7.6 billion people. Okay, so you go and hunt your own meat? Yeah, so I recently got my hunting license. Mm -hmm. um, I've been a fisherman my whole life. So while I was vegan, I was like, you know what? I don't need to fish because I don't need I don't need meat. Both my experiences on veganism, I felt like shite. And um, I did, I tried everything. Uh, I wasn't the kind of guy, you know, who I'm going out and eating like hot Cheetos and grilled cheese sandwiches. And I'm like, why do I feel like shit? I was eating all the right like whole foods kind of stuff, but it just wasn't working with me. I, my body does not run well on like legumes, like beans and lentils and that kind of stuff. What happened? Did you fart a lot? Did you, <laughs> like, did you shit too much? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have great bowel movements. That's true. I found cognitively was the biggest thing. Like brain fog, uh, 
like crashing uh, blood sugar levels after you have a huge meal of carbohydrates, um, very, very poor cognitive functioning and ability mm -hmm. to focus. So I don't know if I have like a candida overgrowth in my gut biome or like what's going on. Cause very clearly like there's people that can function amazingly on a mm -hmm. vegan diet. There's bodybuilders on Instagram, vegan bodybuilders who are absolutely jacked, but I think it, it can't necessarily work for, for everyone. It, it is a very new diet. Um, and this is going to get a huge amount of like outrage from my vegan friends whenever I say this kind of stuff. But I think, but I think it's true. Like it, it's not necessarily a solution for everyone out there. Right. Why, why hunting though? Why, why is that uh, a good solution for you? So I've always been a fisherman. My father's been a fisherman. There's many fishermen and hunters in my family. Mm -hmm. One thing that people don't realize about hunting and fishing in North America is that it's highly regulated. So in Ontario, for example, uh, with fishing and hunting, the province is split into all these different wildlife management units. Every single year, they monitor every single population's uh, size, like how many turkeys are there? Is the population increasing or decreasing? Okay, this is how many hunting tags we can issue for wild turkeys in this area of Ontario for this year. Then the next year, they monitor the population like, oh, there's even more turkeys. Well, we're gonna issue 5% more tags this year. And then the third year, oh, the population is going down. We're going to reduce the number of tags. So to get a hunting license in the first place, you have to take a two-day course. You have to get above 85% on a test. You have to get a, uh, a gun license, which again takes two days okay, and you take okay, a test. How, it's highly the, regulated. The American driver's license is a joke. So how, how <laughs> difficult is the hunting license in Canada? Well, you definitely need to pay attention. Right. I mean, in terms of uh, ethics and, you know, shot placement and, you know, caliber choice, bullet choice, like all this different kind of stuff. So to make a long story short, it's highly regulated. It's, it's very sustainable. And even the way like you hunt, like you only take shots when the animal is uh, standing still and you know that you can get a clean, like ethical shot on it. Um, so it's sustainable for environmental uh, perspective. In terms of like uh, uh, animal ethics, these animals are dying within five to six seconds of being shot. Like when you get, sh like shoot a deer between, like a double lung shot on a deer, it's dead within like five to 10 seconds mm -hmm. max. So if you compare that to how deers normally die in the wild, like getting eaten alive by a pack of wolves or coyotes, or most commonly for wild deer, you starve to death in the winter time or you freeze to death. On the uh, you know suffering scale, being shot by a hunter is the most painless death for a wild deer in Ontario. Right. So then you shoot the deer, and yes. then what happens? Then you butcher it. Right. You, you do it on side, get it home. How does that, I, I'm not a hunter, I have no idea. Okay, yeah. Well, you, you gut it is the first step. Right. Uh, then you will quarter it. If it's too big to pack out in quarters, then you have to fully, you have to further butcher it down to where you can fit pieces on in your backpack. On site, out there? On site, That's yeah. That's a bloody mess, isn't it? Uh, it? It can be a bloody mess, yeah. Sometimes people might have like an ATV nearby where they can drive over, put it on the ATV, <clears throat> bring it back to your hunting camp, um, do something like that. But it is actually illegal to shoot an animal and not take its meat in the field. Because when you talk, I mean, there's bad, there's bad actors in any community, right? Mm. But the vast majority of hunters that I know and uh, you run into in, in, on social media, they do it for the meat. Like the idea of trophy hunting, like shooting an animal just for its antlers or something, that's very frowned upon in the general hunting community. Mm. Or like you can't just shoot a deer, cut off its head, and then leave the body to, to waste in the field. Like you will lose your hunting license permanently for doing something right. like that. But I mean, then the coyotes would eat it. That's not a bad outcome, is it? Though. The coyotes would eat it, but then they they want to discourage trophy hunting. They right. don't want people out there just shooting the animal for the animals. Oh, antlers. okay, okay. All right. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I actually meant like in case you were, you got it. Like I was just thinking like, what, what do you do with oh, the, the remains? Like do, do you take them with you? Or like, is that something that actually you would leave out for? So like the stomach animals? and the intestines, which yeah. makes up the majority, or the lungs, which makes up the, the majority of the mass of the guts, yeah. that gets eaten within like 48 hours. Right. Yeah. It gets scavenged, birds, coyotes, bears. And so you, you feel ethically it's better. Yeah, um. <laughs> it's very interesting because, so I feel it's compared to eating animals for the industrial animal, uh, animal agriculture system, like the kind of meat that gets served at, uh, at Walmart or at McDonald's, I think it's absolutely more ethical um, mm -hmm. because these animals live outside a wild life their entire life, running around, enjoying all the wonders and the horrors of freedom. And uh, then they, they come to a death that is much quicker than what a wild death would be. Mm. And then they get eaten by people who greatly appreciate that animal. Mm. The other side effect of that is that hunters are very invested in conservation 
because no hunter wants to see fewer animals on the landscape. So if you see the kind of organizations that are doing the majority of the funding and work to preserve wild animals on the landscape, it's actually hunting groups. Mm -hmm. So the, for example, wild turkey, uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, elk were hunted to extinction back in the 1800s in Ontario. The groups that reintroduced those three species to Ontario within the last 15 years were all hunting groups because those are groups who want to see these animals on the landscape. So it's kind of a weird thing, right? Because I think humans are like tool using animals. We view things in the world as, do I use this or do I not use this? Like, do I love this or do, do I not love this? If nobody hunts and nobody cares about wild animals, uh, nobody's invested in them in necessarily in, in protecting them. And I know there are like, there's some wildlife photographers out there, right? I don't believe there's as many wildlife photographers as there, there are hunters, um, but there's nobody more invested in having as many wild animals in the landscape as fishermen and hunters mm. are. So it's kind of this paradoxical thing. Right. And this is like something, you you kind of got me into this. Um, I believe there's a huge business opportunity in you know animal products or just food in general. Because the, the problem today is that you go into a restaurant and it says chicken, or it says 12 ounce of beef. Yeah. I don't really care about 12 ounce or 16 ounce, right? Like. I don't care about the quantity, I care about the quality. Yes. And if I would be given the chance, if I would be given the chance between meat A in a restaurant for X amount of money, or meat B where I'm told this is where it grew up, that's it was fed, this is how it was treated in a sustainable way or you know ethically, right? This is the space that it had, especially with eggs. The, the one thing that actually you should know about is how many birds per hectare. Yeah, right? yeah. If I was given the choice and the information as a consumer, I wouldn't just choose chicken, but I would use chicken that comes from outside and cuts double three times. Yes, I can afford it. Not everybody can. So that's a sustainable bit. But I think it's sad that even we as people who could have afford it and who want to be mindful, we can't really have it. But that gives an opportunity for entrepreneurs, right? And speaking of um, being an entrepreneur, so you're not just an actor, but you started your own coffee company. Correct, yes, right? One Tree Coffee. One, One Tree, Tree coffee. coffee, yeah. Okay. So it's organic coffee, fresh roasted. We roast it on Tuesdays and we ship it out to our customers within 24 hours, so it's very, very fresh. Like most of the time, Starbucks coffee, it's gonna be a month to two months by the time you drink it, which is stale coffee, so it tastes like shite, um, but most people don't know any better. So anyways, mm -hmm. it's we compete on quality and also sustainability. So our packaging is 100% compostable, the beans are organic, and we also we plant one tree per cup brewed, okay. um, which I think is a pretty cool concept. Uh, every time you drink a cup, we're planting a tree. So when did you, when did you get started with this? About a year ago, and the first eight months, we were actually running it under a land conservation model, and it was very difficult to grow our volumes. And like for example, our social media ads were performing horribly because it's very difficult. I found it was very difficult to communicate to people, drink this coffee conserve land. Because when you say conserve land, people don't know what that means. It's very mm. difficult to um, dimensionalize that in the average consumer's mind. It's like conserve land, it's like where? What land? Why are you conserving land, right? Like how much land is it? It's very difficult to communicate that in a 30 second or 15 second video. Versus we create something new, we plant a tree, and you understand that in your head what's happening. When you say plant a tree to somebody, people understand immediately mm. that that's a good thing. Like you don't need, to, you need to do zero explanation with that. So, uh, so far that's been going much better. Mm -hmm. um, our social media ads have been performing much better with the, the, the tree model. Is it a good performing business? You're profitable? It is profitable. Mm -hmm. um, it is not to a point where I can like do it as a full-time job yet, um, but uh, it, I'm happy with the direction that it's going in, right. for sure. And what is your job within that company? What, what, what do you actually do versus what do your partners do? So um, I am, it's my sister and I that are doing mm -hmm. the company. Um, the only employees we have are delivery people and then the people we roast, to, we hire to roast the coffee, our beans for us. So we roast at a Boulder, Colorado for the United States and then here in Toronto for the Canadian market because it's not something you can ship across the border. Right. How, how, did you, how did you get started with this? Like literally, how did you get your first beans? How did you get the idea even? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was a coffee fan. It was literally like it was a PNG thing. It was like I wanted to sell something to my social media followers and uh, something that uh, you know I that would that many people used. And in North America, about seventy five percent of the population here drinks coffee on a, on a daily basis. So it's something that's it, there's a big size of price for it. And so if you got one percent of the coffee market in North America, it, it's it's a huge fucking market. It's worth the you know risk to go after that. And um, it's um, it's also something that uh, can be done in a sustainable way. 
Mm. Um, so I thought it would be a good vehicle to drive funds for an environmental cause, which at first was land conservation, but now it's 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 planting trees. How many photos do you have in China versus here? So in China, I've got about 360,000 mm -hmm. on Weibo. On uh, on Instagram, I've got 36,000. Mm. But I've got 36,000. There's only 10,000 in the United States, 5,000 are in Canada. Okay. So it's really only like 15,000 because I'm only doing the coffee in North America right now. Yeah. And is that big enough though to, to actually start a business off? So what I found out, no, mm. it's not big enough. Um, and also like many of those people are Chinese, like Chinese Canadians, Chinese Americans. And because most people over there, their parents never drank coffee. Uh, but to, to make a long story short, the way that most Chinese consumers drink coffee is from cafes and I'm selling freshly roasted beans. So they don't necessarily have that culture of brewing coffee in their home. They drink it right when they get up in the morning, like most people in North America do. I'm not sure what it's like in Germany, but, um, I have not lived in Germany for 13 years. I can talk to you about Australian ass. coffee and others, which is the best in the world. But well, I, I have Australia, heard that about yeah. Australia actually, mm -hmm. but, uh, in North America, the number one consumption occasion for consumers is is brewing coffee in the morning in your home. Right. So it wouldn't be, so you'd think a B2B business wouldn't be something you were, where you go after, where you actually give high quality beans to coffee shops where consumers have the choice between maybe coffee A, coffee B, you know, one for a dollar more and they plants a tree, something like that. That's something you, you have not considered? or not so, right, so we actually serve in 13 different offices in Toronto, which is actually a very good business um, mm. to get into offices. So yeah, you better introduce me to the general manager of Google. By the way, thanks for reminding me. I would love to serve coffee here um, <laughs> or globally. So uh, yeah, like B2B, getting into cafes is difficult because most cafe, like independent cafe owners, like in Australia, from what I've heard, like the scene in Sydney or Melbourne or something, uh, it is so competitive on a quality front that like you need to be, you need to go in there pitching them. Um, it's, just, it's just extremely c competitive to get into that space. Like I would have to be spending all my time running around to individual cafes, pitching them. It's not as scalable Why as- Why not hire a salesperson? So I could, um, but I want to be spending all my time and money on online because that's the most scalable right, thing. Right, okay. um, like the PNG thing, it's like, you know, yeah. where are you gonna fire a bullet? On, on this and it's definitely the online, mm. the online game. Okay. Yeah. So how do you market it online? Uh, so Instagram ads, um, Facebook ads, both like images and videos, uh, videos have been performing better for us. Uh, right now I'm actually not running any ads because I'm finding that I'm still expanding the sales just organically through my own follower base right. by doing more and more posting about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it until a point where I feel that I've reached the maximum potential of that and then go into, um, online ads. I'm not sure if it has changed, but for Evergreen, I noticed that you had a few personalities out there, like Princess Leia, <laughs> you dressed up as Princess Leia, speaking of masculine James, right? That's, yes. uh, yeah. Uh, with the hair and, and the dress and everything. Yeah. Uh, you dress up as Pablo Escobar, yes. right? Yeah. You have a thing with sort of the. Kim Jong Il's Pablo Escobar is like the, the the a bit of the crazy people out there. One hundred percent, man. Um, yeah. So how much how much are you selling yourself versus coffee? What's the strategy there? So, it's um, it's it's definitely selling the coffee, but it's like trying you know what skill sets do I have that that can be beneficial in that. So what I've decided recently is. Uh, uh, so I just came back from China for the last time in December. I finished filming over there and I decided that I don't want to go back to China anymore um, because it's 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 the quality of life there I do not like. I want to start working and living in North America. I want to, you know, potentially have a family and I'd rather start that here in Canada. And um, I want to start for the first time producing content for social media. So I'm producing a show called Evergreen News and I've shot about three weeks worth of material already. It's a video series about environmental news and news about Earth in general, in short video clips, done in a very humorous way with multiple different characters. Basically you, you using- You think you're funny. What's that? You think you're funny. Exactly, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm using my split personality disorder to, uh, to a, for a good cause, right. but I'm trying to build this good content for people that can, that can show this information in a creative way, but that can also be a vehicle for getting the word out about, about our coffee. Mm. Um, because this content I can also put uh, onto my Chinese social media because I've been, I've been very lazy. I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in social media generally, like people with followers either get it from producing great content or from being somewhere in traditional media. And because of their work in traditional media, they get followers, but they're lazy. All they do is post pictures of themselves and mm -hmm. what they're eating. And that keeps their followers happy, 
But if they didn't have that job in the traditional media, they wouldn't have any followers. So I was lucky because I got it from traditional media in China, but now I want to go to war and try to, you know, make great content and try to try to continue growing my followers. Like How that. much of what you've learned at PNG is actually applicable here? And then the reason why I'm asking is because, um, you know, being in the safe environment of a corporation and there is money, you fail, you might not get promoted, worst case scenario, you get fired versus doing your own thing. Like that marketing that they do there versus what you're doing on a small scale now, is that actually comparable? Is that, does it have to do anything with the reality of building your own business? hundred percent. I mean, all the principles from marketing, which I'm sure you've learned absolutely in your roles at, at Google, um, it's absolutely applicable to the mm -hmm. different scales. I right. mean, the, the theories don't change at all, I think. One of the things for me um, is that doing two things at once, like doing entertainment work and having a startup business, um, it's difficult because time is the most precious commodity. Right. And I have not spent nearly as much time as I need or as I want on like the coffee company. Mm. So I'm hoping that... Um, you know, doing this evergreen news program, it is more related to the coffee than my work over in China. And I don't want to continue going to China doing work over there. I don't want to continue working in that marketplace. Speaking of China, right? And, and you just mentioned you don't want to live there anymore. You don't want to go back. Does that mean no more acting for James Adolfs in China anymore? Is, are you done with this? Or you, do you still do the acting? You just don't want to live there. Um, I still want to do acting. Right. But... Um, I don't want to live there. Right. It's extremely polluted. Um, there's a terrible quality of life. You've been you've been there. It's it's very for me for somebody that loves nature. You can't live in, in China. Mm. There's too many people there. Mm. It's not that the Chinese are, for example, particularly environmentally unfriendly. It's just the fact that there's 1.4 billion people in a country smaller than Canada, and Canada has 35 million people. The only reason Canada has not destroyed uh, ourselves environmentally is because so we have cold. so few people, and it's so cold, man. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, like you couldn't have 100 million people in Canada because we can't grow enough food for 100 million people. Mm. To to summarize you as a person yes you have big fucking balls right um to say that in a politically correct way you're <laughs> courageous okay right? and a lot of people are thinking of doing something it might be becoming an actor or starting their own company do you have a piece of advice to somebody who's at that brink or thinking about it or maybe had many ideas and never really did, did anything to to take that hurdle is it about talking to 50 women a day and lying on the floor or what, what is in a mall till you've been kicked out? Is there some advice you could give somebody that's applicable here? Yes, the first piece of advice, uh, two things. One is not everyone has the personality suited to, to doing something entrepreneurial because being an entrepreneur is extremely difficult and there's high levels of, of chaos. And I think certain people, like you talk about the chaos and order dichotomy, certain personalities can handle higher levels of chaos, certain personalities cannot. There are, there are many people out there that should stay as an accountant at KPMG because that is probably the, the best thing suited for them. Others who are maybe 50-50 on the fence or who are actually more suited to handle that higher pressure of entrepreneurship, um, you have to put things in perspective. This, I guess, would be the second part of uh, it is a miracle to be alive. Um, the chance of being born as a human being on Earth, I think I've heard, is like one in 400 billion. So to be this sentient being like we are, to have near like godlike faculties and powers is such a fucking blessing. So are you gonna waste that doing something that you don't like? Like that, that, is, that is a ridiculous, or that has no meaning, for example. Um, that is a ridiculous way to waste your one chance at existence. The other thing is, is if you look at your op the, the percentage chance of being alive at all in this universe, it's basically zero. This is the only, the only planet in the observable universe of like 10 billion light years or whatever that has life on it. So if you're gonna waste your little shot, like doing something that has no meaning, like to you personally, that is that is absolutely insane. The other thing is, is that uh, I think the most uh, useful framework for looking at life is probably a concept from the Old Testament, which is you should look at leading a life that uh, has meaning on three levels of analysis, that you are doing the most you can for yourself, but then also for society and in the world. Because if you're doing everything you can just for yourself, you're not reaching like your maximum potential as a human, as a human being. And I think many people are not. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very interesting way to, uh, to think about things. Is there something looking back that you wish you would have known earlier or just something that you've come to realization that you think would have been amazing to know before? 
I think I struggled for a long time with nihilism and that our society does not set up young people. Can you, can you define nihilism for the, for the listeners? A lack of meaning. Right. What is the purpose of life? Mm -hmm. Like, why am I here? Because I find society and probably for the last 200 years or so, it's been like this. It's, it's about, it's essentially the pursuit of happiness. Like happiness is the ultimate goal. And that's how I lived my, my life for a long time. And it wasn't until I discovered this, these environmental problems, I was like, wow, like happiness is such a hollow, fleeting and suicidal goal for a species to have at, at a global scale. Because essentially it's hedonism. It's like the pursuit of pleasure, um, which is fleeting. Like, I mean, pleasure and happiness, it's, it's a fleeting biochemical mind state, right? I think Yuval Harari talks about this in Sapiens like how ridiculous of a concept happiness is, right? Um, but it's also suicidal because you look at the, th the things that we're doing to pursue happiness at a global scale, it's causing all of this ecological destruction. We're pursuing luxury while destroying the things that we need. And the, th the, the happiness and the luxuries that we're pursuing, they're fleeting. Like I found, you know, getting, when I, when I hit 250,000 like social media followers, I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, I'm not gonna feel good about myself until I hit 260 and like 270 and 280. And then eventually when I, when I got up to like in the 300,000s, I'm like, I don't even fucking care about how many social media followers I have. I'm like, why don't I feel happy? Like I'm getting to be with all these really hot chicks and I'm making money and I'm getting all these social media followers. Like, why aren't I happy? I'm like, Jesus Lord, like what's going on? Like the, 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 the formula is not working for me. And I guess once I found the environmental thing, I'm like, this is a cause that's greater than me. And if I work towards this, I feel good on my personal level. This is also good for the world. It has nothing really to do with happiness, but it gives my life meaning. And then that's the first time where I actually felt like uh, I am content. Like I'm not happy, but I am satisfied. And that gave a huge amount of reassurance to me like, okay, my life actually has meaning to go to go work on these environmental problems. But I think that uh, if I had known that from the beginning, and again, I think this might be linked possibly to the retreat of many of our ancient religions in modern society. Like science is just completely erratic. I guess Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead, right? We have killed God with, with science, essentially. We have lost many of these ancient moralities that are actually very useful as a instruction manual for how to be a human being. Um, so I wish I had known that earlier on, um, about, uh, you know, meaning and nihilism because I struggled with that for a few, I would have lived my entire life differently from day one if I had known that or been taught that. Mm. So it's about purpose. Purpose. Mm. Hey, this is Alex again. Thank you for staying to the very end of my first episode. I would love to hear your feedback. Tell me what you liked and also what I could do better. You can email me at hello at escapeartist.fm. My Twitter and Instagram handle is I am Alex Nick. That's A that's I A M Alex Nick. If you have that friend who's dreaming about doing something in their career that will make them happier and needs a bit of inspiration or nudge, share this podcast with them. In the next episode, you will hear an amazing interview with Reese Scott. She worked for Condé Nast for 19 years, ended up being depressed and overweight. One day, walks into a boxing gym. The trainer essentially looks at her and tells her to fuck off. She didn't. Instead, she fell in love with boxing and today runs the only and very first all-female boxing gym in New York City. Check it out. Don't miss it. Make sure to subscribe on any podcast platform of your choice. Also... I'd like to thank a very special person, Bilal Zaidi. He is the host of the Creator Lab podcast. He helped me a ton. His show is amazing. Check it out. See you next time.